I'm joined now by United States Senator Tom Cotton of the great state of Arkansas. Good morning, Senator Cotton. Good morning, Hugh. Good to be on with you. Thank you. You got a couple of young lads. I hope they play baseball, and I, I hope you know that General Issimo should never umpire their games because he called out my grandson on a film of his Inside the Park home run this weekend. But, Senator, you've got a couple of young lads. This is a serious question. I asked Molly Hemingway and Bethany Mandel this. Would you let the President of the United States, as infirm as he is, supervise those lads for a weekend? <laughs> well, Hugh, uh, first off, my boys do play baseball. They were very excited by the Red Sox winning the series this weekend over your Indians. Oh. Um, but we're also, exci- we're also excited that your Indians beat the Yankees last night. In dramatic yeah, fashion. scored three in the top of the ninth. Yep. <laughs> So, uh, no, of course, I would not allow President Biden to be in charge of my children for even a moment's notice, nor do I think many other parents would as well. Look, the, the president's condition is declining for everyone to see. Uh, Joe Biden is too old today to be president, much less at 86 uh, if he seeks re-election. Uh, and that's just the simple simple truth of the matter. Uh, you know, the media is beginning to gingerly report stories like this, you know, acknowledging that he basically only does public events between 10 and 4, and uh, that he's being cloistered in the White House, protected from meetings. I mean, like, one reason why he hasn't met with Kevin McCarthy in months is I think his staff is worried that Kevin McCarthy uh, would negotiate circles around him and that they can't allow that to happen. Yeah. Do you have any idea how the debt limit talks will go? I mean, who is going to actually make the decision here? Because I don't think the president can take in the information, the numbers, and make decisions and cut deals. Well, Hugh, I, I, first off, I commend Kevin McCarthy and the House Republicans for passing a good bill last week that uh, would increase our debt limit so we don't default on our debt, but also address the underlying causes of how we got $31 trillion in debt. And right now, that bill is the only game in town. Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer are demanding that Republicans in the Congress pass a debt ceiling with no reforms whatsoever. Hugh, that couldn't get 50 votes in the U.S. Senate, much less 60 votes. So... What we should do is take up the bill that the House passed and begin to debate it in the Senate. Now, maybe Democrats want to play chicken with our uh, national creditworthiness, and they'll filibuster that bill. But no other bill has a chance of passing right now in the Senate either. And if that's the case, then the next step would be for the president to sit down with Kevin McCarthy and begin to negotiate a bill that will both increase our debt limits in a responsible way that addresses the key drivers of our national debt. Now, he is infirm, and so I, I just trying to imagine the meeting where they lay out the papers, sort of like if you've got a senior in your office as a lawyer, you can't really let them sign things unless you've got one of their kids with them who will attest that they are competent. They're going to have to have, have Jeff Zients or somebody else in there with them. Do you think Senator Schumer will be the de facto president for these negotiations? <laughs> um, no, Hugh. I mean, Sch- Schumer is being very cynical right now, which is typical uh, in demanding that uh, Republicans in the Congress do his work for him. Um, But again, House Republicans passed a bill. They're the ones who have taken action to protect uh, our nation's credit worthiness, but also to address the reasons that we got $31 trillion uh, in debt. And a a much more important number right now is 218. That's the number of votes in the House that it takes to pass a bill, and they've already achieved that. Chuck Schumer has not achieved 60 votes, and he certainly won't achieve 60 votes with his preferred method, which is just an, an irresponsible, simple increase of the debt ceiling without any reforms to our runaway spending. Okay, we agree on that. Now let's turn to the Judiciary Committee, which is going to hear, hold a hearing on Supreme Court ethics. I would like to know, you're a member of Judiciary. Uh, Dick Durbin is putting it out that you actually have authority over the Supreme Court to regulate their financial disclosure. You don't. If you pass a law, you can pass a law. You can do anything you want. It's like anyone can file any lawsuit they want. They get dismissed. It is unconstitutional for the United States Congress to attempt to legislate about the Supreme Court's ethics practices. Agree or disagree? Hugh, I'm not yet ready to agree or disagree. I think it's a a close constitutional question, and there's people I respect on both sides of the matter, to include you. Um, but more to the point of today's hearing, this is about trying to delegitimize the Supreme Court and try to intimidate it from adopting rulings that are consistent with the law and the Constitution, but inconsistent with Dick Durbin and the Democratic Party's policy priorities. And it's been a conservative series of hit jobs 
against conservative justices over the last month or so, starting with Clarence Thomas, moving on to Neil Gorsuch, moving on to uh, Scalia School of Law. Um, every turn, you've had mainstream liberal media outlets working in concert with the Democratic Party to try to launch personal attacks against conservative justices, when in reality, as those stories acknowledge, there's nothing contrary to law or regulations or ethics codes that they've done. Well, I applaud your caution, because a, a good senator should hear both sides. But to me, it is basic constitutional law, like the term limits case, what is it, U.S. term limits v. Thornton, where the, where the court ruled you can neither add from nor subtract to the qualifications for office. The only remedy that the Congress has is impeachment if the Supreme Court justice has done something wrong. Abe Fortas quit because he was double-dealing and breaking every rule in the book and probably was going to be liable for criminal penalties like Spiro Agnew. This just seems to me to be a circus, and now um, CNN and others have got, got the bit in their mouth, the Post especially, my friend Ruth Marcus. They really think you guys can pass a law. You can't. I mean, I, yeah, I hope you it, get a witness. The left, the left has the bit in their mouth for sure, um, and they are, uh, again, trying to use this uh, hearing to delegitimize the court because they don't like the court's rulings that are consistent with the Constitution and our original understanding of that document. Um, you know, if they're so exercised about uh, dealings with family and friends and so forth, maybe they could pay a little bit more attention in the liberal media to what happened in Batesville, Arkansas yesterday, where Hunter Biden, once again, is trying to evade responsibility for a child he fathered, a child that Joe Biden and Jill Biden won't even recognize with the stocking on their Christmas mantle when they hang stockings for their cat and their dog, pleading poverty uh, down in Arkansas so he can reduce child support payments for his daughter while all of his father's rich friends and family members are paying for his mansion, climbing around the country and taking him to Ireland and buying his finger paintings for $500,000 a year. If they were, are worried about double dealing with family and friends, they should be looking to the courthouse in Batesville, Arkansas, not the courthouse across from the United States Capitol. Did he uh, show up for the hearing this time? He did show up. The judge last week ordered him to show up. As she said yesterday in the hearing, Hugh, that this case was a very normal case up until January. And I remind you how this case restarted. In September, or I'm sorry, in 2020, uh, they reached a settlement, as parents often do, to, uh, on child support and presumably other matters. I don't know the terms of it. It was um, sealed, as these things usually are. And last September, Hunter Biden, not uh, London Roberts, Hunter Biden went into court to try to revive that settlement. Again, pleading poverty, saying he didn't have enough money to support his child, even though he was living in mansions all across America and selling his finger paintings for $500,000 a year, to his, or $500,000 a painting to his dad's friends. And then in, the judge said yesterday in January, the case just dried up. There's no more cooperation. And I think that probably was that Hunter Biden realized that he was going to have to start revealing the details of his financial uh, um, situation. And how is it that a man that drives a Porsche and lives in mansions and jets around on private planes and can afford Abby Lowell as a lawyer can't afford his child support payments? So if now, Abby Lowell is not cheap. That That is not well, an inexpensive well, Good lawyer, but he's not inexpensive. Well, Hugh, Hugh the, 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 in the, the picture in the courtroom spoke for itself yesterday, and London Roberts' lawyer made this point. It's like, look, he has Abby Lowell and big law firm partners from Chicago and Los Angeles and one of the top domestic relations lawyers in Texas sitting at that table. How is he affording all that? How can he come into this court and pay Abby Lowell's hourly rate, which is probably more expensive than some people's car payments each month, and surely more expensive than some people's car payments each month, actually, <laughs> and, and plead poverty. And the answer is, no doubt, that Joe Biden and his family and their friends and donors have arranged Hunter Biden's financial affairs so he can lead a lavish lifestyle, yet plead poverty when it comes to showing his own actual... I, income did, I was unaware of who he had at the benches. I, I did not know his legal team. That is $3,000 an hour if that's a dollar an hour. Exactly. And again, remember, he's the one that restarted this case. They reached a settlement in 2020. It was going to allow my wow. constituent to live quietly in her hometown and raise her daughter that Joe Biden and Joe Biden won't even acknowledge exists. When Joe Biden runs around claiming he has six grandchildren, not seven grandchildren, and Hunter Biden is the one that went into court in September and pleaded poverty and said, I need to reopen this case so I don't have to pay as much child support. 
even while he's selling finger paintings for five hundred thousand dollars each and living in mansions all around the country. Hey, and let's close. Abby Lowell's hourly rate. I, I, that is astonishing. I didn't know that. Let's close with Loper Bright. Yesterday, the United States Supreme Court granted certiorari in Loper Bright. I've had Paul Clement on this show to discuss it. It is the case in which the Chevron Doctrine can and I hope will be overturned. What do you as a member of the Judiciary Committee think about the court returning to revisit Chevron deference, Senator Cotton? Well, I'm glad they granted uh, uh, cert in this case. I heard that interview with uh, Paul Clement, an outstanding Supreme Court litigator, um, and not just a member of the judiciary, but as a member of the Senate, I think it will help put responsibility back where it belongs, on the shoulders of the people's elected representatives. Chevron deference has in some ways aided uh, the rise of a gargantuan administrative state uh, that is ever spreading its reach into uh, more minute and private details of everyday life. Uh, you you uh, know, when you have your hearing aid, today... I wish you would advise the chairman the time would be better spent educating the American public on Loper Bright and the administrative state than harassing the justices of the United States Supreme Court over whom you have no authority concerning their financial disclosures. But that's just me. I'm not a senator, senator. So good luck on the <laughs> Judiciary Committee today, because I just think this is a hit job. I, I really do. I, I, I do not think people understand what is going on here. Let's close with that. This, as you say, it's very, very well-financed attack on the court for the purposes of delegitimizing it to pave the way for expanding it, which will mean the end of the rule of law. That, that is absolutely right, Hugh. It, it is a well-financed and orchestrated hit job by the Democratic Party, progressive activists, uh, and the liberal media to try to attack, smear, and intimidate conservative justices from upholding the uh, Constitution and the law. As Justice Alito said in a recent interview, uh, the, like the leak of that, uh, the Dobbs opinion last year, it caused people to try to assassinate some justices. That is, that, well, good luck in that hearing today. Senator Cotton, always a pleasure to talk to you. Don't get Dwayne as an umpire for the kids.